Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to look at the RG552, which is Ambernick's latest retro handheld device. Now this device is quite different from the RG351 series that we've been seeing for the past year and a half. And so despite the fact that this video is quite long, I'm still going to consider it a preliminary review. I've only had the device for a few days at this point, and we don't have any custom firmware at this point either. And so I really just want to take a look at its potential and whether or not this might be a device that you would want to invest in. And so in this video, we're gonna take a hard look at the hardware and then also some of the software options that we have available. For example, this device can boot both into Linux as well as into Android. And we'll also look at emulation performance, at least with this initial firmware. I think much like the RG351 series, this device is just gonna get better and better the more people pour energy and time into it. And so in addition to just looking at what we have available, I'm also gonna to try to capture the scope of the promise of this device itself. And to give you a quick preview, I think there is a lot of promise with this device if taken in the right context. For example, when I play some retro games on the RG552, I can honestly and unequivocally say that I've had some of the best retro gaming experience I've ever had on a handheld. But as you'll see later on in this video, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's worth its entire sticker price. And so we've got a ton of ground to cover, so let's just dive right into it. Let's do it. Okay, let's start with some specs. We'll start with the CPU itself. This is an upgrade from the RK3326 that was in the previous 351 models. This is the RK3399. It has six cores with a clock speed range between 1.4 and 2 gigahertz. It also comes with a four core ARM GPU and four gigs of LPDDR4 RAM. On top of that, it has 64 gigs of eMMC storage, which is available on the Android side. And it has a very impressive LCD touch panel with a 5.36 inch size and five by three aspect ratio with a significant screen resolution of 1920 by 1152. In terms of battery, it has two 3200 milliamp hour batteries, which allow for fast charging and will give you about three to four hours of gameplay. In terms of operating system, it runs Android 7.1, but can also dual boot into Linux. The stock Linux firmware is a modified version of Botocera 29. In terms of connectivity, you have 2.4 gigahertz of Wi-Fi as well as mini HDMI. It should be noted there is no five gigahertz Wi-Fi on this device and no Bluetooth either. All right, let's get into a quick unboxing here. The box itself is significantly larger than any box that Ambernick has released before. But other than that, the design seems to be the same. One unique component of this device is it comes with a 30 watt charging brick. This is the first I've ever seen in a retro handheld device. I think this is pretty handy. It also comes with a USB-C cable, screen protector, and SD card. Depending on whether or not you pay for more, you may also get a games card of 64 gigabytes. And surprisingly, the manual in this is fairly handy. It actually has some pretty good info in it. And now for the big reveal. So my device is the black metallic version, but they also have a gray version too. Despite looking like it is metal, this is actually made out of plastic, but it is quite heavy. It almost feels like a metal device. Personally, I prefer plastic devices. So for me, this is actually really nice. My very first impression here, this thing is quite hefty and a little bit heavy too. It is sizably chunky. I've heard that this device has some flex to it, but honestly, I really don't feel that. Sure, it's made out of plastic, but I don't think it's going to snap anytime soon. But yeah, as expected, this Ambernick device has a premium feel to it. I wouldn't expect anything less. In all, I would say it's a familiar feeling device, just bigger and heavier. So now let's take a look at the I.O. On the left here, we have some volume rockers here. Now, personally, I prefer volume wheels, but all the same, it has a very low profile. My only complaint about this button is that it feels relatively loose in the case. In fact, it rattles when you push on it. It's unfortunate because this is the only button on the entire device that is loose like that. Up top, we have the traditional Ambernick shoulder and trigger buttons, for better or for worse. Now these buttons are nice and clicky, they have a micro switchy feel to them, they are not terrible. My biggest complaint at this point is just the layout of these buttons. Unfortunately, the bigger the device gets, the more awkward it is to touch these trigger buttons. More on that later. Now, regardless of the position of the buttons, they're sturdy. They feel good when you push down on them. Also up top, we have an exhaust vent because this device has a fan inside of it, which is pretty crazy for a retro handheld device. And thankfully, it also has HDMI out, as well as a headphone jack, USB 3.0, and a USB-C charging port. But yeah, that's about it for up top. On the right side, we have a power button. Now this power button seems to stick out a little bit more than your typical Ambernick device. Not a bad thing, but you may accidentally press on it. It sticks out just a little bit too much. 
On the bottom, you have stereo speakers, which sound very nice, as well as two micro SD card slots. The left one is for the Linux operating system, and the right one is for storage. Finally, we have a reset button as well as a function button. And to be honest, I think it's kind of awkwardly positioned. There have been several times where I've accidentally pressed the reset button instead of the F button, and that can be annoying. Okay, on the back we have the traditional Ambernic pads, and the only logo that you can find on the device is here on the back. It now has this new grid look on the back, as well as a fan intake. It's a little bit strange that they placed it on the side of the device instead of the center, and your fingers are going to cover this intake, which means that you are going to feel as they pull in air when you're playing the device. As far as the front design, this is your typical Ambernic design. The only big change is the face buttons have been colored for the first time since the RG300. Now let's take a look at the D-pad. Now this has a typical Ambernic design to it. It is a rubber membrane connector, and it feels a lot like an old gamepad, like from the NES or the Super Nintendo. That being said, it feels softer than some of the RG351 devices that we've seen over the past year or so. It almost feels like a D-pad that's already been broken in. As far as the select and start buttons, they also have a rubber membrane connection and they feel good. They're nice and squishy. These analog sticks are very similar to what we've seen before. They're basically switch style analogs with pretty good rotation and they also click down for L3 and R3. Okay, let's take a look at the face buttons now. Now these face buttons feel almost identical to any of the other Ambernic devices. These also have a squishy rubber membrane feel to them, but they're still quite responsive and bounce back very quickly. I would say these are some of the best buttons in the business and they're always a pleasure to use. That being said, I wish they were a little bit bigger. Now, I've mentioned it before, but this is a chonky boy. Let's do a quick size comparison against some of the other popular models out today. We'll begin with the device that started off the last generation, the RG351P. As you can see, it's massive compared to that one. And even the most recent Ambernic release, the RG351MP with a 4x3 display, is dwarfed by this. I always joke about how the RG351V is large, but really it's about the size of the screen of the RG552. And then other devices, like the Retroid Pocket 2, are similarly small by comparison, and it's quite a bit bigger than the PS Vita as well. Now the RGB 10 Max with a 5 inch screen here is also smaller, same thing with the RGB 10 Max too. Here's a comparison against the PAL Kitty X18S. Really the only devices that are bigger than it are some of the really big ones, like the Nintendo Switch Lite or even the regular Nintendo Switch. And I think another good comparison would be against a modern cell phone in a telescopic controller, and here you can see the LG V60 is quite a bit bigger than the 552. So now let's talk about weight. This thing weighs 367 grams. That is really heavy. So let's do some comparisons. The RG351P is about half that weight. And even some of the heavier Ambernic devices, the RG351MP or even the RG351V are still quite a bit lighter than this. Same thing with the Retroid Pocket 2. This is also almost about half the weight. And even larger devices like the PAL Kitty RGB10 Max, the Max 2, and even the PS Vita are all still quite a bit lighter. For the most part, most handheld devices are under 300 grams. Here's the Switch Lite or the 3DS. The X18S is over 300 grams, but this thing has a lot of plastic to it. At the end of the day, just bear in mind that the 552 is a hefty handheld. And while it feels insanely large and premium in your hands when you're playing it, that does come with some drawbacks. And I think the main drawback here is ergonomics. When you're just holding the device and using the D-pad and face buttons, it feels incredible. But as you use the analog sticks, as well as the triggers, and especially when you use them in conjunction, it becomes very awkward. And that's because, in addition to being quite longer than a lot of other handhelds, it's also taller too. And that tallness when using non-stacked shoulder and triggers, like you have here on this device, does make for an awkward feeling. I think the best way to describe it is to show a different device. Here's the 351P. Now this seems a lot like the 552, but just more compact. It has the same layout and everything, but because there's not as much distance between the buttons and the triggers themselves, it's just easier to use. Even a taller device like the 351P, which you see here, is still manageable. You can touch the trigger buttons while using the D-pad or the analog sticks. It's a little bit of a stretch, but it's not terrible. And really, the 552 is not that much taller than the 351P, but when you have it in your hands, it just feels a lot different. Like I said, it's not terrible with the D-pad and the triggers, but when you try to use the analog sticks, especially with more modern control schemes, it does become quite significantly hard. Now I have medium-sized hands, but if you have smaller hands, like my 12-year-old son here, it becomes quite a stretch to be able to use the analog sticks as well as the triggers. And if you're like my 5-year-old, it's basically impossible. And of course, if you don't have opposing thumbs, it's going to be even harder. So 
Bear in mind, if you're going to buy this for a child or for your cat, then this is probably not going to be a good fit. Long story short, my main complaint about the RG552 is using the shoulder and trigger buttons. It was a little bit annoying with the 351 series, but with this one, it's basically unplayable. Let me show you an example in context. Here's Cruisin' USA on the Nintendo 64. In this one, the Z button is mapped to the L2 button, which means you have to press down on L2 and then the analog stick to move around. And this is extremely uncomfortable, and after a minute or so, my hands start to tire immediately. On top of that, sometimes I don't even realize I'm not pushing down on L2. Now I can map the Z button to one of the face buttons, but that also means that I'm going to have to make a compromise with those face buttons as well. It just feels like with all the innovations inside of the 552, the shoulder and trigger buttons are probably one of the spots where they should have innovated the most. Surprisingly, the company who's innovated the most with shoulders and triggers is Palkitty. Look at the RGB10 Max 2. In addition to having shoulders and triggers reminiscent of the Nintendo Switch Lite, they've also improved other parts of the ergonomics. For example, it flares out at the bottom now, and it has these little mini grips around the back edges. Altogether, the RGB10 Max is a pleasure to hold, and if the 552 had had this similar shape and stacked shoulder buttons, they would have knocked it out of the park. I really hope that in future iterations, Amronic is going to start using these Nintendo Switch style shoulder buttons, and maybe think a little bit more about ergonomics, instead of just sticking with that same formula they've been using for the past couple of years now. I think another thing that would help with ergonomics is if the device was a little bit more rounded, something a bit more like the PS Vita. The rounded nature of this device makes it so that you can cup your hands around it no matter the size, and I think this is a really good design. So at the end of the day, these ergonomics are my biggest complaint about the device. This thing is now more powerful, where you can use systems that relied more heavily on trigger buttons, and at the same time, Ambernick has made these trigger buttons less accessible. It's really a shame. When it comes to portability, I don't think this is really what I would consider a pocketable device. Yeah, it can fit in my shorts pockets, but I don't think this is something I would ever walk around with in my pocket. Okay, I think I've talked enough about the size and the feel of this device. Let's actually turn it on and see what the gameplay is like. Now, like I mentioned, this runs a modified version of Bodicera 29. They're just calling it the Linux operating system, but it's very apparent that that's what they used. It takes about 13 seconds from the time you push the power button to when you can actually navigate the menu. That's a pretty fast boot up, I like that. And like with other Linux based firmwares, this one also uses an emulation station front end. So you basically will navigate through your systems, choose your games, and then it'll boot into RetroArch or other emulators. And the 64 gigabyte storage card they ship with the device does have quite a few preloaded games on it. And the organization of these games is actually quite a bit better than it was on the 351 devices. That being said, I also appreciate the fact that by default, they ship this device with only the operating system and none of the games. That's a really good thing from a legal perspective, at least here in the United States. So let's boot up game here, because I want to talk a little bit about the unique nature of a 5x3 display like you have here on this device. And we'll start with Game Boy Advance. Now the GBA had a 3x2 aspect ratio on the original devices, but as you can see here, by default, they've actually stretched it to the full 5x3. Now you can set the aspect ratio through the Botticera menu, but for now I'm just going to jump into RetroArch so I can show you in real time what it's going to look like. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go back into the settings menu, and then we're going to select video, and then scaling. And within here we can see the different aspect ratios. Now the display here has been rotated in the kernel, that's why it says 3x5 instead of 5x3. And so the easiest way to fix this in RetroArch is actually to set it to the 1x1 setting, which is the square pixel setting. That's going to give you a 3x2 aspect ratio. So now that we have the correct aspect ratio, let's talk a little bit about integer scaling. Now the 552 has a 1920 by 1152 screen resolution, and that's insanely high resolution for one of these retro handhelds. And this is going to work to our favor when it comes to integer scaling. Now the original Game Boy Advance had a screen resolution of 240 by 160. And so if we go back to the settings and then the scaling menu, and then we turn on integer scaling, that's going to move up the screen size by a factor of the original Game Boy Advance resolution. And by virtue of using such a high resolution on the 552, that means that Game Boy Advance with integer scaling is actually going to be a 7x integer scale of 1680 by 1120 And I know I'm just throwing a bunch of numbers at you at this point, but this does have some meaning to it. What this actually means is that because this has such a high resolution display, you're going to be able to turn on integer scaling for any of the retro systems, and they're all going to look really good, and you're going to have minimal black bars on the top and bottom. 
Playing Game Boy Advance on this device with a 7x integer scaling is just incredible looking. This is by far the best Game Boy Advance experience I've ever had on any retro handheld bar none. Even the RJ351P and M, which did a 2x integer scaling and looked very nice, pale in comparison to the 552 screen. This is just incredible. On top of that, this screen has a wonderful color balance as well as temperature, and it also has incredible viewing angles. This is one of the best screens I've ever seen on a handheld device at all. In fact, it's better than many cell phone screens. This is a really nice display. Now, since the 351P is so good at Game Boy Advance, let's do a direct comparison. Now, the 351P has a 3.5 inch display at that original 3x2 aspect ratio. That being said, the 552 with integer scaling on at a 3x2 aspect ratio is still nearly 5 inches of screen. To be perfectly honest, I wasn't really sold on this device when I first saw its price tag, but the moment I turned on Game Boy Advance and had it at perfect integer scaling, I really started to see what Ambernick was trying to do with this device. This is an incredible moment when it comes to retro gaming. Now on top of that, thanks to the more powerful chipset inside, you can play around with more shaders and filters. Now some of the really high-end shaders are still not going to work on this device, but personally I really like the LCD 3X shader anyway, and this one looks really good. It has a nice LCD grid to it, and it just looks super good when it comes to Game Boy Advance as well as the Game Boy systems. Okay, let's talk about 4x3 content since that's the majority of what you'll be playing with a lot of these retro systems. Now a 4x3 display does have larger black bars on the sides here, but even then with integer scaling it still looks very nice. In fact it's quite a bit bigger than the RG351MP which has a native 4x3 display. Now the 552 with integer scaling on and a 4x3 aspect ratio still gets about 4.5, almost 4 and 3 quarters of screen. That's still really significant. And it's quite a bit bigger than a 16x9 display like the PAL Kitty RGB 10 Max, which only gives you about 4 inches on a 4x3 display. So let's break down the numbers like we did with the Game Boy Advance. As a reminder, the 552 resolution is 1920x1152. Now the Super Nintendo resolution varies by who you ask, and I'm not going to get into it, but an 8x7 aspect ratio will give you 256x224 pixels, and a 4x3 aspect ratio will stretch that out to 293x224. Since we're using 4x3, we'll stick to those numbers here, which means that with integer scaling on, you're going to get a 5x resolution at 1465x1120. And that basically means you're only going to get 16 pixels at the top and the bottom of this display. In fact, they're basically impossible to see. And so this is another big win for this device. If you want to play Nintendo Super Nintendo Genesis games with integer scaling on, you're going to have a big, beautiful display with just about perfect pixels. In fact, this is probably some of the best retro handheld gaming that's available today right now. And here's what it looks like if you use an 8x7 resolution with something like Super Nintendo or NES. It's going to have bigger black bars on the left and right, but it's still pretty good looking. Now one thing to note is the firmware that's currently shipping with the device has some audio lag with the Linux operating system. Now fortunately this is a pretty easy thing to fix in the configuration and I'll leave a link to a new firmware link that you can burn onto a new SD card which fixes this issue here. So at this point I would consider this issue to be resolved and it'll obviously be fixed in custom firmware in the future as well. Now one thing I do want to point out here for any of the pixel purists out there, if you do a 5x integer scale it's actually not going to be perfect integer scaling. I believe you need a times 7 integer scaling to get perfect pixels. And that's why with Mega Man 10 here you can see there's just a little bit of a distortion with his life bar on the left side. And honestly, you really can't see this difference unless you're really looking for it. But all the same, if you want to fix it, you can use something like this sharp bilinear scanline shader, which is going to cover all that up and have a really nice retro look to it as well. So long story short, retro gaming on this device, be it on the Linux or Android side, is pure pleasure. The chip itself is hefty enough that you can play everything using the modern core with integer scaling and a shader with a run ahead of one and still get really excellent gameplay. This is the best classic retro gaming experience I've ever had on a handheld. So if like me you're a huge fan of Super Nintendo or Nintendo or Sega Genesis and you're looking for the best screen and the most premium experience, when it comes to this market today the Ambernick RG552 is the best experience you can find. And you're really not just limited to those systems. Any 4x3 system is going to look great on this, and even Game Boy and Game Boy Color are still going to look pretty good. They're going to have larger black bars on the left and right, but all the same, it's still a great way to play Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Another thing to note about this display is that it actually looks pretty good in direct sunlight. 
Now it doesn't look super good right here because I'm kind of filming at an angle, but honestly, this is a device that I would gladly play outdoors. And I can't really say that with a lot of retro handhelds, but this one I think does actually fit that bill. Okay, that's enough about the hardware and screen. Now let's talk about the emulation performance on the Linux side of this device. In general, I found that Final Burn Neo and MAME 2003 Plus are the best arcade cores for this system, much like it was for the 351 devices. One thing to note here is I actually found the D-pad to be a little bit too soft for my liking when it comes to an Ambernick device. I actually had a hard time doing fireballs and hurricane kicks in Street Fighter. I'm hoping that my fingers will just kind of adapt to this lighter playing style, but for now it kind of was a little bit frustrating. The first thing I wanted to test when it came to arcade gameplay was whether or not the Killer Instinct games would play on this chipset, and unfortunately I'm sad to report that they do not play at full speed. In fact, you get about 45 to 50 frames per second with the first Killer Instinct, and only about 40 frames per second on Killer Instinct 2. This is kind of a bummer, and I'm not really sure that any sort of upgraded firmware are going to improve this performance either. Now for some arcade games, you can go in and turn on Tate mode, which will give you vertical gameplay. But I have to be honest, I really didn't find this worth it. In addition to making the controls a little bit too cramped for my liking, the device itself is just too big and long to really be able to hold it effectively. So I think if you're really planning on using vertical shooters with this device, I would maybe think twice. Okay, moving over to console gameplay, we're going to stick with just the default emulators that are available in Botocera. So here is the Yabasan Chiro Core running in RetroArch on Linux. And when it comes to 2D Saturn games, the gameplay performance is actually really good. I think if you're going to play any sort of role-playing games or maybe some beat-em-ups like Guardian Heroes, you're going to have a really good time running Saturn on Linux. And surprisingly, even 3D games seem to play relatively well. You're going to get a frame rate of about 52 frames per second when it comes to 3D games like Sega Rally Championship, but all the same, the gameplay is relatively smooth. It's obviously not a solid 60 frames per second, but all the same, this is genuinely playable. And same thing here with Nights into Dreams. Every once in a while I would hear a little bit of an audio stutter, but altogether this was actually really enjoyable. Now unfortunately the Nintendo 64 performance on the Linux side is not very well optimized. I found that I had the best performance using the Parallel RetroArch Core with a 640x480 resolution and the Angry Lion video plugin. And with many games like F-Zero as well as Super Smash Bros, it plays at full speed and with minimal graphical glitches. But many of the harder games are going to be basically unplayable. For example, here's Mario Tennis. It has graphical glitches and tons of slowdown when you're playing. Now you do have other emulators available, like the standalone Mubin 64 Plus using the Rice plugin. And this works okay, but unfortunately you can't make any settings changes, so you can't adjust the aspect ratio, and you also can't see the frames per second. So my hope is that custom firmware eventually will make this better. So regarding Dreamcast on RetroArch, this is running the Flycast core at a 640x480 resolution, and honestly the gameplay is smooth. I would get some audio stuttering here and there, but overall I actually had a really good experience. Now that being said, the readout of frames per second were surprisingly low on RetroArch, and I'm not sure if this is just a glitch when it comes to the graphics, because altogether this felt like 60 frames per second, even when it would show something like 38 or 42 frames per second. So honestly, I think that's probably an issue with RetroArch. Altogether, I did find really smooth gameplay when it came to Dreamcast for almost every single game. It's obviously not perfect, there is definitely some audio stuttering here and there, but overall, I would consider this to be a smooth gameplay experience and the games look very good with this larger display. Now that being said, the Dreamcast performance is much better on the Android side, we'll get to that here later in the video. And finally let's talk about PSP. Now this is very hit and miss with the standalone PPSSPP emulator here on the Linux side. Certain games like Vice City Stories played really well with a 2x resolution. There would be some stuttering, but not a lot. Same thing with Virtua Tennis World Tour. I would consider these to be about medium difficulty emulation games. And for the most part, you could play all of these games at a 2x resolution, no problem. But of course, if you try to push it beyond any of these medium level PSP games, you're definitely going to run into some issues. Outrun 2006 is a great example. As you can see here, with a 2x resolution, you have to put on an auto frame skip of 1 just to make it playable. And even then, it's kind of jerky. Now when you start pushing the system to its limits, like here with Outrun, it's going to turn the fan on and it's going to get pretty noisy. And like I mentioned, your fingers are going to cover the intake vent. And what that's going to boil down to is you're going to feel some movement around your fingers, which is a little bit distracting. And as the device heats up, the air is going to get pretty warm too. That being said, most of the warm air actually comes out of the exhaust at the top, and so your fingers aren't actually going to touch it that often. 
All the same, it can get pretty noisy. Let me turn the volume up for you here. Okay, so what if you wanted to use your own SD card to put all of your games onto the device on the Linux side? Well, it's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is take a blank SD card, make sure it's formatted to XFAT or FAT32, and then just plug it into your second SD card slot, and then just make sure your Linux operating system is in the first card slot. So all you have to do is actually power on the device, and once the operating system loads, it's going to write a bunch of folders into that second SD card, and that's going to be everything you need to start loading up all of your games. So let's shut down the system, and then we'll take out that card and put it back into our computer. And as you can see, it has a single partition with all the folders you need here. So all you have to do is just start throwing in all of your ROM files, and you're going to be good to go. I think this feature is super convenient. Now, if you take the first SD card and put it into your computer, you'll find that it has two SD card partitions, and one of them is called the games partition. And within here is actually where you're going to put your BIOS files. And it's also going to have other folders, like where you would put your themes, as well as ROMs if you wanted to just use a single SD card. Now, bear in mind, if you put ROMs into this first SD card, as well as have a second SD card, it's actually not going to read the ROMs on the first SD card. It'll default to the ones on the second card. And one last note about Botacera, unfortunately, it does not have a sleep function. I expect this will be a component of other custom firmwares, but for this one at least, you can't use sleep. Okay, we're about halfway through the video now. Let's move over to the Android side of the device. To boot up into Android, all you have to do is take out that first SD card slot and then boot it right up. And we'll measure the boot up time for this one as well. Now, this is booting off of the 64 gigs of internal storage that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. And this runs a customized version of Android 7.1. And as you can see here, it takes about 25 seconds to boot up. So that's about twice as slow as the Linux side, but it's not terrible for Android 7.1. Now, the Linux side doesn't really have a use for the touchscreen on this device, but the Android side is going to rely on it very heavily, and it's actually really handy. Now, this Android image comes with a bunch of preloaded software, including ATV Launcher, as well as a bunch of emulators, including paid emulators that really shouldn't be on here in the first place. And essentially what you can do is use any standalone emulator and then actually launch the games from the second SD card just like you did on the Linux side. And I really love this concept. It allows me to use the same games on two different operating systems in a sort of symbiotic relationship. It works out really well. Now I'll probably end up doing an entire Android setup guide for this device, but let me show you a couple tips real quick. For example, up top it has this large blank space. This is actually pretty easy to get rid of. You just hold on to one of the apps and then select Launcher Settings then Sections, and then Widgets, and then under Show Section, just turn that off. Now you won't have that Widget section at all, and you have just basically all of the tiles. This, to me, looks a lot better. On top of that, there's a lot of apps on here that you actually probably aren't going to want to see. So, same thing here, let's go into the Launcher Settings, and then under Hidden Apps, you can just select all the apps you don't want to see on your main page. It's not going to uninstall the apps, but it'll at least make them hidden. And that'll give you a much cleaner interface as well. Now, one consequence of using the touchscreen on this device is you're going to have a ton of fingerprints all over this device all the time. So if you're going to use the Android side a lot, I would just get used to having a microfiber cloth handy because you're going to want to use it. So in addition to using standalone emulators, you can also use launcher apps that'll make the navigation process a little bit easier. The two that I tested with this device are Dig and LaunchBox. And this is the Dig app here. I've actually installed this custom Alec Full NX theme, and it looks pretty dang good. One of the nice things about Dig is it'll actually scan your entire SD card, identify all of your systems, and then scrape all of the media too. From there, all you have to do is set up the appropriate emulator for each of your systems, and then you're good to go. You can launch directly into the game, and then as soon as you exit that game using whatever hotkey you set up, you can actually go right back into Dig. The navigation experience is not perfect on this. There are some stutters and stops as it goes along, but all the same, this is probably the closest to emulation station that you're probably going to find. By the way, this is what Game Boy Color looks like with that LCD3 grid that I showed off earlier with Game Boy Advance. This also looks really good on this display. Now, Dig is the only front end that you can use. For example, here's LaunchBox. LaunchBox isn't free. This costs $25 for a license. But after you've paid $25 for that license, you can use it on any device for the rest of your life. And it's pretty easy to import the license as well. That being said, the LaunchBox app is kind of a work in progress. Yes, you can sort it by different systems, and it will scrape some nice box art and logos and things like that, but it's also kind of jerky and stuttery and just kind of feels like it's in a beta phase. 
But the concept is the same here. You can launch into your games once you select whatever emulator you want to use. And then when you close out of the game, it'll actually take you right back to the menu. Again, not a perfect experience, but it is much better than having to tap through a bunch of emulators. That being said, at the end of the day, I prefer Dig over LaunchBox, at least between these two. Now there are other options available like the Reset Collection and Pegasus. And one of these days I'll actually do an Android front end video like I've been promising for months now, but I just got a lot more to learn and so I'll get to that eventually. Either way, if you're going to get this device and use the Android side, I would recommend using Dig first and then branching out from there. Okay, much like what we did with the Linux side of the operating system, let's check out the emulation performance on the Android side. When it comes to running retro systems, 8-bit and 16-bit systems in RetroArch, as expected, the performance is incredible. You can use all the same tweaks that we did on the Linux side, you know, the run ahead and integer scaling and shaders, and they're all going to work really great on this. Now, unfortunately, some of the higher end cores are not going to work very well. For example, here's the BSNES HD core running a widescreen patch of Mario World. And unfortunately, I couldn't get it to go past about 35 frames per second. So even though it does look incredible to play widescreen Super Mario World, unfortunately, it's just not going to be possible on this device. Moving over to Nintendo 64, the emulation is much better on the Android side than it is on Linux. Mupin 64 Plus just runs incredibly well. In fact, you can upscale most Nintendo 64 games to 720p with the default settings, and you're still going to get perfectly smooth performance. For some of the harder to emulate games like GoldenEye and Cruisin' USA, I would recommend pushing it down to 480p, but for the most part, I would say 720p is going to be your default for Nintendo 64 on this device, and that's really awesome. When it comes to Nintendo DS, the Drastic app on the Android side supports touchscreen functionality, which makes games like Metroid Prime Hunters really easy to use with your finger. Now, unfortunately, the Linux side doesn't support touchscreen like this, so it's not going to be possible, but the Android side is really good. In fact, you can increase the resolution for most games and it'll still run really well. Overall, Nintendo DS on the Android side of this device is really good. Now, I didn't show PS1 on the Linux side, but it runs just fine and you can actually run it at 2x resolution. But on the Android side, you have the Duck Station standalone emulator, and this is going to allow you to push it to about 3x resolution for most games. And so in that regard, the PS1 performance on the Android side is definitely better than on the Linux side, at least right now. That being said, you can't push every PS1 game to a 3x resolution. For example, Tekken 3 runs best at a 2x resolution. Either way, PS1 is great on both ends, but better on Android. And similarly, the Yabasan Shiro standalone emulator on Android runs better than the RetroArch core on Linux. By default, this one is going to have an auto frame skip, which will result in faster gameplay, but you will see some hiccups here and there. All the same, if you're a big Saturn fan, I would recommend using the Android side, and for the most part, every Saturn game is going to play really well. I'll show off a couple more when we get to the HDMI section. When it comes to Dreamcast, the performance was pretty good on the Linux side, but I would say it's better on the Android side, and a lot of that is thanks to the ReDream emulator on Android. Now, this is the non-pro version, which means that you cannot upscale it past 480p, but all the same, most games are going to play perfectly on this one. There will be some games that have issues. I think NBA 2K1 is a great example. This one is going to slow down noticeably here and there, but overall, it's still pretty good. And honestly, the games that don't play at full speed are going to be very few and far between. I can comfortably say that if you're a big fan of Dreamcast, this device is probably going to suit most of your needs. So another thing that annoys me about the Android side is that the device itself doesn't have a back button, which means you're going to have to swipe up to get to the back button that's on the screen. And often I found it pretty hard to actually get that swipe up menu to show up. And so it gets kind of annoying when you have to spend 10 seconds just to exit out of one game. And of course, that's going to drastically increase the amount of fingerprints on your screen too. So once again, make sure you have that microfiber cloth handy. Okay, let's move on to PSP performance. In general, the 2x resolution seems to be the sweet spot with this system. 1x resolution just looks a little bit too muddy for my tastes, but 2x resolution actually seems to perform pretty well with, I would say, about half of the game catalog. So games like Soul Calibur and Virtua Tennis, games that played well on the Linux side, play equally well, if not a little bit better, on the Android side too. But unfortunately, OutRun 2006 still cannot play at full speed at 2x resolution. As you can see here, it dips down quite a bit as you're playing. And of course, turning on an auto frame skip of 1 is going to fix all of those issues, but it does create a more jerky experience and it's just not quite as smooth. And for a device that costs over $200, that's pretty disappointing. And for those who are curious, here's how God of War Chains of Olympus plays on this device. 
When you use a 2x resolution with no auto frame skip, you're going to get about 40% speed. This is kind of terrible, honestly. And what makes this even more disappointing is all the teasers for this device happen to show off this game as if it was going to play at full speed. But even then, if you turn on an auto frame skip of 1, you're actually only going to get about maybe 75% of full speed gameplay. That's also disappointing. And even if we take it one step down to a 1x resolution with no frame skip, we're still only going to get about 75% gameplay speed anyway. So unless you're willing to take the time to do the hacks and configurations, I would say that higher end PSP games are really not going to be playable on this device, and that's really disappointing. Now because the stock Android operating system is running at 7.1, the PS2 emulator is not possible on this. It requires Android 8 and above. But they did preload the Dolphin MMJ GameCube emulator, so you can test some GameCube games on here. For my testing, I used the PAL versions of the games, which means they're going to max out at 50 hertz. but even then the gameplay is almost unplayable on every single game that I tried. As you can see here, Paper Mario crawls at about 30 frames per second altogether. Luigi's Mansion does a little bit better, but unfortunately it has a lot of graphical glitches, and this version of Dolphin can only run the Vulcan backend, and so you can't switch over to OpenGL to get better graphics. So I would say this one's unplayable too. Of the games I tested, I would say that Wind Waker was the one that was closest to playable. This one still runs at about maybe 80% full speed. And honestly, I don't intend on playing Wind Waker at this speed at all. I'll just wait for something else. Now, it might be possible in the future that a custom ROM will be able to increase the clock speed on this device and maybe get some better gameplay, but honestly, I kind of doubt it. At least based on what I'm seeing, I would bet the GameCube is never going to be really possible on this device at all. Now, because this device only has 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi, a lot of people are curious as to whether game streaming is going to be possible on it. So let's test that now. We're going to start up Moonlight here, and we're going to go into Steam, and I'm going to play Hades, a PC game running off of my PC, which is really just a few feet from my device right here during testing. And while testing this game, I actually experienced zero hiccups at all. It was actually a very pleasant experience. So at least based on my limited testing here, PC streaming from your computer over your local home network is actually probably going to be mostly playable. So I decided to step it up a little bit too. So via my Chrome browser, I logged into Xbox Cloud Gaming and then started up the Halo Infinite campaign. And definitely while playing this game, I experienced a lot more delay when it came to my inputs. And I'm not really sure if that was on the Microsoft side or if it's actually due to the Wi-Fi chip on this device. Either way, the connection was pretty slow with significant pauses and even a freeze near the end. But all that being said, it actually wasn't a very fun experience anyway. And that's mostly due to trying to use the triggers and the analogs at the same time. Like I said before, my medium sized hands are just too small for this experience. I really think that if this device had stacked shoulder buttons, I would be singing a different tune. But as it stands right now, I don't really care about doing streaming on this device because the controls are so bad. And so, yeah, the Wi-Fi isn't the best. And sure, I had some freezes and some stuttering. But all the same, the controls were actually what prevented me from enjoying this, not the Wi-Fi connection. Now, when it comes to media streaming, the 2.4 gigahertz actually seems to be pretty good. So here I'm running my Plex home media server via the APK that I sideloaded myself, and it actually is accessing my home library very easily. And so if you wanted to play media either through like YouTube or through a Plex server, if you have one, it actually seems to work out pretty well. And this screen makes the content look really nice. Okay, and last note about the Android operating system, this one does support sleep. So all you have to do is tap the power button to turn on sleep and then tap it again to wake up. I'm not really sure what the battery life is going to look like when it's in sleep. I haven't had the device that long to tell you, but it does seem to work pretty well. Okay, last feature I want to test out here is the HDMI out capability of this device. Now this uses a mini HDMI connector, so you're going to want to have one of those cables. But much to my surprise, when I plugged it into my game capture card, it worked out perfectly. On top of that, it scales everything to a 1080p resolution. And so because of that, everything actually runs really well. Now, a couple quick notes here. When you're running on the Android side, like I'm doing here, it's actually going to display everything on the display while you're playing. So that's probably going to drain the battery a little bit faster. But all the same, navigating through everything is very nice and snappy. I couldn't detect any sort of delay between the HDMI connection and what I was playing. So in essence, you could use this thing as like a mini console hooked up to your TV. And thanks to the fast charging of the battery and the 30 watt charging brick, you can actually charge this device while plugged in while still playing it. And so in that sense, you don't have to worry about the battery draining when you have it plugged into your TV. 
But as I mentioned in the introduction, this unfortunately does not have a Bluetooth chip inside. So you're going to have to use a Bluetooth dongle if you want to connect a controller, or you're going to have to use an OTG cable and a wired controller like this BTOP one here. Not the end of the world, but it does make your device have a bunch of wires sticking out. Now the Linux side works equally well too. And a couple notes here, because it resizes the resolution to 16 by 9, when you hook it up to the HDMI, it's actually going to show borders on the side of all of your major systems. And so when you're playing a particular game, it's actually going to show these system bars on each side. Now you can turn this off in the settings, but personally I really like it. Now one of the drawbacks of using Bodicera 29 is that this version had a lot of audio issues when it came to HDMI. And so initially when you plug this thing in, it's going to turn off the screen on the device itself, but the audio is going to continue to play on the device instead of on your TV. That being said, in future versions of Bodicera, they fixed this issue. So if they had used a better version of Bodicera, we wouldn't have this problem. Okay, we've gone through all of the things I wanted to show off. Let's talk about what I like and what I don't like about this device. We'll start with what I like. For starters, the build quality and craftsmanship is really good on this device, as I would expect from any Ambernic product. And probably the most premium component of the entire device is the screen itself. I love the resolution. It has the perfect aspect ratio for all of the various systems that it supports. And the touch screen is super handy when you're using the Android side. The overall feel of the buttons and D-pad are very good. I have some issues with the D-pad itself, but overall it's a pleasant experience. I also am a big fan of having HDMI output on my devices, and it works really well on both the Android and Linux side of this device. And probably fundamentally, one of my favorite things about this device is the dual boot option. I'm a big fan of Linux-based operating systems, but I also appreciate the performance you can get from Android. And so in that sense, we have the best of both worlds. If you're willing to kind of master both sides, then you can easily pick whatever side you want, depending on what system you're in the mood to play. And I would say, across the board, this device is a huge leap in improvements over the RG351 series. The screen is better, the performance is better, the sound seems to be a little bit better as well, and this thing charges super fast, and I appreciate the fact that it comes with a power brick. All in all, these are really good features on the device. But of course, no device is perfect, so let's take some time and talk about the things I don't like about this device. And unfortunately, the list here is quite significant as well. I know I've talked about it to death at this point, but I'm really not a fan of these shoulder buttons. I wish that they had used stack shoulder buttons, especially if they were going to use a taller device like this one. Overall, it just feels like the ergonomics on this device are unevolved. I really hope that the next hardware thing that this company focuses on is going to be the ergonomics of the device itself. At this point, it's one of the more uncomfortable devices available in the market. And I've got a lot of thoughts about this software in particular, but let me sum it up really quickly. Number one, Ambernic is just not very good at developing software. I consider them to be more of a hardware company than anything. But unfortunately, they really don't involve the development community as they're developing the device. What they do instead is they hand out a bunch of free devices to the developers after they've created it and sent this half-baked software out into the world. Which means that these open source and unpaid developers have to basically scramble to fix all of the mistakes after the fact instead of working with the company to make optimal firmware that ships with the device in the first place. And I just don't think that Ambernic really thinks that far. There are other companies that do a really good job with this. For example, with Hardkernel, they ship out their Odroid systems as dev kits several months before the device releases, and that allows the developers to have a software that's available at launch. And the same thing happened with the Game Force Chi. That one actually got official MULX support. And so I really hope going forward that Ambernic really thinks about the fact that they should just give these dev kits to the developers ahead of time and also consider paying them to ship an open source operating system available for everybody at launch. All the same, I do expect that developers are going to create custom firmwares for this in the future, but it's really unfortunate that they have to do catch up instead of working in collaboration. Okay, enough of my high horse, let's talk about the other things. So battery life on this is not perfect. It gets about three to four hours of battery life depending on the system that you're playing. And that makes sense. This is a really hefty screen and the chip itself runs really hot. And luckily this device charges very quickly, so it's not like you're gonna be without playing this device for very long. Next, I'm not a fan of the function button placement. I don't like the fact that it's so close to the reset button and it's very similar in just the overall feel of it and I've pressed the reset button several times on accident instead of the function button. Instead, I wish they had put the function button somewhere else and also included a back button which would have been really helpful on the Android side. 
When it comes to performance, you know, I wasn't expecting the world, but I am disappointed with how PSP played out. I really was hoping that we could play 2x resolution with every game, but it seems to be that only about half to three quarters of games are going to be able to play at 2x resolution on either operating system. And the fact that this device has no Bluetooth and as well as no 5 GHz Wi-Fi is really unfortunate. I think those would have been really customer friendly upgrades and the emission of them feels really weird on a device that costs so much. And so now let's talk about price. So $227 is quite a significant amount of money. In fact, that price is over double of many of the devices in the RG351 series. And for that price, the amount of improved performance is actually kind of negligible. Instead, what I think you're really paying for is that upgraded screen. And this screen is really, really good. But I'm not really sure if that screen is worth an additional $100 of what you would pay for one of the RK3326 devices. If, in addition to that screen, we had excellent performance with things like PSP and maybe even a little bit of GameCube, I think that I would be saying a different story. And the reality is that Ambernick has always priced their devices a little bit more than their competitors anyway. But at $220, $27. This is significantly more expensive than other devices like the Palkitty X18S, which runs for $170 and has much better performance than this one. And so I do think that this price is too high. I think it would have been more competitive at $199, and I'm hoping that at some point that price will drop to that, but who knows when that'll happen. If you take something like the RG351 MP, which runs for about $150, I could see how this device has $80 worth of upgrades. Having an active cooling fan inside of the device must have been really expensive to develop and produce. And like I've said many times before, this screen is one of the best in the business. And so in the context of Ambernick's little cinematic universe, sure, $227 makes sense in the context of the MP or any of their other devices. But when you start factoring in other devices like the Odin, which starts at $199, or the Retroid Pocket 2, which is priced to compete at $99, $227 feels a little bit ridiculous. So in summary, who should buy an Ambernick RG552? Well, I think there's actually three categories here when it comes down to it. There's the buy now, buy later, or don't buy at all. Under the buy now, I think that retro gamers would really appreciate this. If you think that peak gameplay is going to be things like Super Nintendo, PS1, Game Boy Advance, you're not going to find a better experience than on this device. And of course, those who want a really premium experience, who don't mind paying that extra money to have that best experience out there, right now, the 552 is going to be the best one you can find. I also think that if you're tech savvy, if you don't mind flashing custom firmware, experimenting around with settings and things like that, you're going to have a lot of fun tinkering around with this device. I've actually had a ton of fun over the past three days myself. And I think if you're a couch gamer, someone who just plays at your house, this is going to be a good fit. This isn't the most portable device in the world, but if you're going to be playing it at home and in close proximity to the charging brick, then I think this is a good fit too. Now I think there's also a market for people who plan on maybe buying this device later. And the first category I have here is those who are not very tech savvy. For example, they just want to flash a custom firmware one time and then just be done with it after that. Given the fact that there is no custom firmware right now, I think it would be better to wait until later. Because honestly, the stock firmware experience is not that great. I think the custom firmware is going to greatly improve the experience. I also think that people on a budget should consider waiting till later as well, because honestly, this price is probably going to come down in the next six months or a year. And honestly, a year from now, this device is going to be even better thanks to custom firmware and a lot of the other tweaks that we're going to figure out along the way. If you're curious about other systems like the Odin or the yet to be announced Retroid Pocket 3, then maybe it would be smart to wait until later and see how those pan out before you go and drop $227 on a device right now. And finally, if you just recently bought a device like the 351 MP or maybe the RGB 10 Max 2, I'm not really sure that an additional $227 is really going to be worth that upgrade cost. I would say maybe just enjoy the device you have and then once you're ready to grow into this one, then maybe consider. Now there's also a group of people who I do not recommend buy this device at all. If you're looking to just buy one device and be done for several years, I don't think this is the correct device. A lot of that comes down to the shoulder button placement, but honestly, there's just too many little flaws about it right now to recommend that this be the one device you have for several years to come. I think that six months or a year from now, you're just going to have better choices out there. 
Additionally, if you're really looking forward to playing GameCube or PS2 or even high resolution PSP, this is not going to be the device for you either. Unfortunately, the performance on this is just good enough to tease you with those systems, but I don't think you're ever going to get good gameplay of any of those systems here in the future. Additionally, if you are planning on using this primarily for streaming, I think you should stay away from this device. The lack of stacked shoulder buttons makes it an easy miss, and the poor Wi-Fi strength also makes it very frustrating to use. And finally, if you're looking for just one single pocketable device, I think there are lots of other devices that are much smaller that are going to be a little bit more appropriate for that use case. So yeah, that's really it for this video. I know it was a really long one. I think this is probably my longest video ever, but I hope it was helpful for you in making that decision of whether or not the Ambernic RG552 is the device for you. And like I said in the beginning, this is just a preliminary review. I expect several months from now, I'm going to have different opinions about this device. But yeah, at least now with a few days under my belt, this is how I feel about the Ambernic RG552. And I'm really looking forward to spending more time with it and seeing what we can do with it in the future. As always, thanks for watching and let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. And be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.